we go.
Well, it is October, and if you're having a birthday or wedding anniversary in this month, we invite you to participate, celebrate your birthday by giving to World Evangelism Broadcast. There's a basket right behind where Mr. Gene is sitting, and we're going to sing a lovely song to you, and you can rise and make your little gift if you'd like to, or you can do it in the name of somebody else. That's all right, too. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday God bless you, happy birthday to you, happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary God bless you, happy anniversary.
so we don't have to call you and twist you's arms. Okay? <laughs> That's the breaking news for today, and we will see y'all October 30, right here. This is Walter Klondike Bar signing off. Bye, Walter. Bye, Bye Walter. <laughs> Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like a sound of a symphony to my ears. Like holy. Before Jesus died, God's people sacrificed a lamb every, every year during the Feast of Passover. It reminded them that God delivered them out from the bondage of Egypt. And Jesus timed his death so that it would take place at the beginning of Passover when God's people were sacrificing their lambs. This would show that Jesus' death is a, the once-for-all sacrifice of God to save His people from the slavery and bondage of sin. Now we remember Jesus' sacrifice by celebrating the Lord's Supper, instituted by Jesus, in fact, the night before He died. We call it communion, the Lord's Supper, or even the Eucharist, it's a celebration, but it's, it's also a confession that we need to be forgiven. Matthew highlights that point when Jesus says that his blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And you notice that the disciples were the ones who prepared the meal when you read the account of what is called the Last Supper. They gathered, they prepared the food, and, and they set the table. Well, it's kind of like we do for communion today. And every time we take the bread and drink the cup, 
We remember together that we are sinners who needed Jesus to die for us. We had to set the table. We needed the sacrifice. But in the Lord's Supper, our guilt is met by the saving grace of God. Amen? And as we eat and drink, we are assured that God's saving grace overcomes our guilt because of the sacrifice of Jesus. I thank Him for dying in my place so that I could be forgiven. Today we come and approach the table of this sacrament, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And today you will find in your pew racks, as we have been accustomed to doing since COVID began, uh, you will find a prepared cup and uh, the first layer of cellophane covers the wafer, the second covers the cup. Uh, and uh, the, we have open communion, which simply means if uh, you don't have to be a member of the Church of the Nazarene. You just have to know that Jesus saves you from your sins. Amen. And uh, I trust that's your testimony this morning. And uh, so we invite you to participate with us as we approach the table. We are his disciples. And he has invited all who believe in his name to come to the table to eat to your soul's delight. And he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he declared before his disciples, this is my body. Take this remembering that it is broken for you. And in like manner, he took the cup and he said, this is my life's blood, which was shed for the remission and atonement of sins. Drink the cup. Oh God. Thank you for your indescribable gift. That we can be forgiven saved by grace and living in the hope of eternal life a life that begins now and lasts for eternity we thank you that your grace is always sufficient thank you for providing the elements today through your son Jesus Christ I pray Amen
come to your word, I pray that you would open the truth to our minds and hearts, strengthen our walk with you and our faith in you, and may our hearts feast on the bread of life to our soul's delight, I pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> Again, glad to see you guys here today. Thanks for coming. You folks online, appreciate you hopping on board with us today. We are in this series, uh, Courage, Facing Our Fears with Confidence. Uh, last week, we talked about courage as integrity in, uh, in Lessons from Daniel. That was in chapter 1. Um, that integrity means doing the right thing even when it's difficult, uh, doing the right thing even when no one is watching. It, it means staying true to, to one's righteous convictions. It, it means that you can be trusted. If you are a person of integrity, people know who you are. They know the real you uh, because you don't put on airs. You don't, you don't walk in... Uh, somebody else's shoes that you're trying to feel, it's just you, and uh, what you see is what you get, all right? <laughs> uh, today, we're going to continue and, and declare that courage is hope. And here, Daniel and his friends are in a seemingly hopeless situation, aren't they? Uh, they've been taken from their home. Uh, they've been brought to a foreign land. Uh, taken captive, held captive by an ungodly king, uh, forced to learn and follow the ways of that land, uh, forced to abide by the king's commands and forced to serve in his court. Three years of training. And at the end of chapter one, it's completed. This is where it picks up at the end of chapter 1. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, listen to this now, and he found none equal, not even any Babylonians, equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, <clears throat> excuse me, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service probably not their boyhood dream right <laughs> but here they are and then we come to chapter 2 and find that the king has had a dream that has confused him he's not really sure what to make of it and so <clears throat> we're told uh, verse 5 I believe it is uh, Okay, verse 2. Uh, so the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want you to tell me what it means. But that's not all he wanted. 
He actually wanted them to tell him his dream. That's what he said. Astrologers, tell him what he had dreamed and what it means. All right? And, and in verse 5, uh, the king has ordered all the enchanters, the magicians, the sorcerers, including Daniel and his friends, by the way, to be put to death, cut into pieces, and their houses burned to rubble if they could not tell him about his dream. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? We're talking about hope today. You know, more than once I've, I've had somebody say to me, well, you know what, I, I, I'm reading my Bible more, I'm, I'm actually studying it, and I, I'm coming to church, and I'm praying more, and, and I'm, I'm even giving an offering to the Lord, but it's not making any difference. My situation hasn't improved. In fact, I think it's getting worse, and, and, and I don't know what else to do. I've done everything that I know to do, and I've said everything that I, I know to say, and, and I've tried everything I know to try, and, and I've prayed every prayer that I can imagine to pray. And I just, I'm ready to give up. Those are the words of someone who feels hopeless, not someone who is hopeless. Someone who feels hopeless. And you've probably had similar things happen when you, you just feel like you're, you're living right, you're doing everything right, and, and it's just coming up and slapping you in the face. <laughs> Have you ever come to the place where you just don't know what to do? You just, you're stuck. You don't know who else to talk to. You don't know where else to turn. John Ortberg wrote these words. God is not at work trying to produce the circumstances you want. He is at work in your circumstances to produce the you that he wants. And so he didn't change Daniel's circumstances, Daniel and his friends, uh, because they wanted to go back home. No, he worked in their circumstances so that they could become who God wanted them to be. And so when people say, you know what, I just don't know what else to do. What do you do when you don't know what to do? <laughs> and so the, I would take you to Psalms, Psalm 1. This is, this is what is declared by the psalmist. The person who delights in the word of God, uh, the person who refuses to walk in the counsel of the godly, uh, ungodly and, and to follow the ways of the sinners, that person, whatever that person does, prospers. Psalm 1. Read it for encouragement. It's, it's good. So there's the answer. You turn to God and you walk in His ways. I don't, I don't want to oversimplify it. Uh, but, but I would remind us, well, we haven't actually read it, but look at verse 11 in chapter 2. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. Oh, wow. Aren't you glad you're not part of that religion? Their gods don't live among humans. I was reading in my devotions this week uh, from Bob Benson. I just want to share, share uh, a portion of this with you. He writes, God talks to us. His words may be misinterpreted, and they often have been. They may be misunderstood, and many times they are, and they may be misapplied, and it's almost certain that will be. But still, he talks to us. And underlying this willingness to use the ways of men, there must be his serene confidence that he knew he would ultimately be able to make himself known and understood by men. And so these words have a far deeper meaning than the simple relating of a fact about another preacher speaking again. He's referring to Matthew 5, 2, and he opened his mouth and taught them. For this is God. Embedded in these words is the wonder that God would have something to say to us. 
and that from deep within him comes all that he's been wanting to say. He is not a mute God. He's not a God whose ways are to remain unfathomable to us. We're not to forever spend our days wondering what God is thinking and what he wants from us. Because he is a God who talks to us. And, and the, the poor Babylonians were saying, you know, only the gods can tell you your dream and they don't, they don't have anything to do with us humans. Pretty sad, isn't it? But God talks to us, we believe. And so God gave Daniel a plan. It involves three things. Uh, first of all, he asked the king for time. That's in verse 16. You know, too often I think you and I assume that we know somebody's answer before we hear it. Are you guilty of that? Yeah, I know. I'm not even going to go ask. I know what they're going to say. And, and suppose Daniel had said, I would ask the king for more time, but he's already said he's not giving us more time, so it would be just uh, crazy to ask. I've heard it said that it never hurts to ask. Is that true, you think? I think it depends on what you're asking. <laughs> I had a friend who asked somebody something. It's kind of inappropriate, and the next thing he got was a fist to the jaw. So it, it, it did hurt to ask that time. But <laughs> usually it doesn't hurt to ask, does it? Especially when we're talking to God. And, and so don't, don't just assume that you already know God's answer or that you already know someone else's answer because God moves in a way that He softens heart and changes minds. The second part about this is never, ever rush God. He's in a time, on a timetable that you don't even understand. So let's not rush him. He is an on-time God every time. Amen. He's never too late. He's never too early. He's always on time. And so Daniel asked the king for time, and the king said, okay. <laughs> wow, figure that. And the second thing Daniel did was to ask his friends to pray with him. You know that ours is the only faith where God chooses to interact with His followers? That God would let us approach Him and talk to Him and hear back from Him? Pretty awesome. In fact, David declared in verse 21, He gives wisdom. Do you know what wisdom is? So it's not intelligence. Wisdom is the ability to use your knowledge to the very best that it can be used. And so God gives us wisdom. Sometimes He gives us new knowledge also. But He gives us wisdom to know how to act or react in, in various circumstances and situations. And so when you pray, you pray for wisdom. I pray for wisdom every morning. God, I'm entering another day. I know there are going to be times that I need your wisdom. Please begin to give it now because sometimes I'm slow to recognize it. He gives wisdom. And, and what Daniel's teaching us in this second step is that you're not in your situation alone. You don't have to face it by yourself. God has given you a church family. God has given you a community of believers on whom you can lean, to whom you can turn and say, I need help praying with this. And, and sometimes you're that one that somebody else leans on. But he's, 
He wired you to be in community, to live in community. And, and I promise you, whatever it is, you don't have to face it alone. You have a caring church family who will stand beside you. And then the third thing that was part of his plan is that he acknowledged his limitations. You know, sometimes our pride keeps us from admitting that we're incapable of doing a thing. We just want everybody to know how wonderful we are, how intelligent we are, and that we're not getting old. I can do it when I'm 20 and I can do it now. Climb up on that ladder and get on the roof. Won't be able to walk for three days, but I can do it. <laughs> and we're just not going to admit we need help. It's pride. That's really what it is. Now, I've said this before. For me, part of what it is, I don't want to be a bother to anybody else. I just don't want to be burdensome. And so I'm carrying out a table. Not these little white ones, you know, those big, heavy, brown metal ones. And somebody says, let me help you with that. And I said, no, I got it. You realize how much easier it would be if somebody grabbed the other end of that table? <laughs> Especially if I'm carrying it from the end in the first place. That would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? Here's what, here's what they said. No wise man, diviner, or magician can explain the king's mystery. Look at, look at verse 10. I have my glasses somewhere around here. Look at verses 10 and 11 again. These are, these are important verses. The astrologers answered the king. There is no one on earth. Do you get that? They're hopeless. All right? Who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asked is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, but they do not live among humans. Let's continue the reading. This made the king angry and furious, so he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and the men who were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. You remember how he was going to do that? He's going to cut, up, cut them up into pieces and burn their houses down. <laughs> and then Daniel asked the king for time. And then he asked his friends to pray with him over the situation. And then we walk down just a little bit more. And Daniel replied to the king, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he is asked about. Verse 28. But there is a God. <laughs> but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. James said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So Daniel's answer was, I can't do it. I'm not any better than the rest of your magicians and sorcerers and diviners. But there is a God who reveals mysteries and he's my God. And we just had a chat last night. And I'm here to tell you what your dreams mean. And therein is your hope. It's not too good, too bad, too hard for God. Whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation, that thing that, that you've prayed about and cried about and you cried till you have no more tears and, and you've heard over it and, and you've done everything you know to do and you've talked to everybody you know to talk to and you said everything that you know to say, I want to tell you, there is a God who is at work in your situation and He is ready to confound those who have no answers. 
And he's ready to astonish you by the way he works in your life. And Daniel put his hope in God, which led him to courageously place himself in the face of the king and to tell him the truth about his dreams. By the way, this is a very important chapter in the, in the entire Bible. Because in this dream, we find the foundation, the basic outline of, of all of the uh, scriptures of prophecy. In fact, Daniel goes on, uh, the last half of the book of Daniel, uh, it, Daniel's prophecy, and he, and he gives detail. But here, there's not detail. He just says, here's what your dream means, King. There's a statue. And the head of the statue is gold. And, and the, the breast and the arms of the statue, well, they're silver. And, and the legs of the statue, they're made of bronze. And, and the feet are of iron, and then below the feet, baked clay. And then you said that there was a rock that came in at the feet of the statue and crumbled the feet of the statue. Here's what it means. So see, Daniel didn't already, I mean, King Neb didn't tell Daniel, here's what I dreamed, make sense of it. Daniel said, I know what you dream. God's already revealed that mystery to me. And by the way, here's what it means. You're the head. Gold. Nothing stronger or, or better than gold. And by the way, King, God has made you head. You are the king and you are so powerful because God has allowed it to be so. But one day you will fall and when you fall, another nation will come from you. They won't be as, as lofty. They won't be as powerful. And then the bronze represents a third nation. And then the iron, a fourth nation. And the iron is strong. Uh, but then God's kingdom comes in. And overcomes all of the other kingdoms. God's kingdom is the rock. Where is your hope this morning? I don't know. I, I, I think that I, I understand Daniel's interpretation of the dream, but, but I also think that maybe, maybe the gold head is, is, is the symbol of intelligence. King Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the smartest man in the world. And, and maybe the, the breastplate of silver and the arms of silver. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's power, authority. And, and the, the bronze legs, maybe that's strength, physical strength and the iron feet iron's not pure but maybe the, the iron is, is the feeling that no one can stop me these feet are made to go and nobody's going to stop me and if you're putting your hope in your intelligence or in your authority or in your physical strength or in your ability to go here and there without being stopped. Your hope is in the wrong place. But there is a God who reveals mysteries. And He is your hope. And He is at work in your situation this morning. You may feel hopeless, but you're not. As long as there is a God to whom you can turn. Don't give up. 
Trust God's timing. Trust God's answer. I wish I'd explain to you how, could explain to you how he works. I don't have any idea. And I wish I could tell you why some people seem to get all their prayers answered and some people don't. Or why God heals some people from cancer and not other people. And I, I just don't have all the answers to those things. I don't have any answers to those things. But there is a God <laughs> in whom I hope and in whom I place my trust. And the reason that I can walk in peace today is because I know that my God is in control. And there is no army and no government that can separate me from the love of my God. He's unstoppable. And he's at work in your circumstance as well. Father, this morning, I know that in this room and online, there are folks who are dealing uh, with circumstances that, that we know at, at the snap of a finger, your finger, it could all go away. But Lord, that's not my prayer this morning. My prayer is that you would be our God of hope even in the face of seemingly hopeless circumstances. When we have no answers and we don't know what else to say and what else to do and how else to pray and where else to look, we still find our hope in you. Amen. The God of triumph, the God of victory the God of peace. We claim you. Please give us hope in our souls and trust in our hearts <coughs> to lean on you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You believe God's got it? That thing in your life, you believe he's got it? I do. I know he does. And we rejoice in that. Well, thanks for being with us today. Awesome to be together in God's house. I always love it when a family comes together. And uh, we're going to close this morning with a benediction, a, a choral benediction. And um, it, it's, it's so fitting for to, to close out what we've talked about as far as our hope in Christ goes. And so just breathe in his presence and believe in the hope that he offers. Amen. God bless you. Folks online, we love you. Thanks for joining us. Here's our benediction. <clears throat>